accidents are the number one killer of American children, and car accidents are the most common kind of lethal accidents. It makes sense that health officials focus on making car accidents less common and less dangerous. Unfortunately, as with many other areas, regulations don't fully line up with the research. Let's discuss. That's the topic of this week's Healthcare Trio. In 2011, the American Academy of Pediatrics released a policy statement on car safety that recommended that children ride in rear-facing car seats until at least two years of age. Before that, the recommendation was until one year of age. This change caused somewhat of an internet firestorm. It's not terribly hard to get small babies into an American-style rear-facing car seat, but those who are nearly two years old are a different story. They can fight! They resist. It can be miserable for everyone involved. The authors of the AAP guidelines seem to be on solid ground, though. They relied heavily on a 2007 study in the journal Injury Prevention that extracted data from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's car crash database from 1988 through 2003. They found that children from newborn to 23 months who were restrained in a front-facing car seat were 76% more likely to be seriously injured than a child in a rear-facing seat. In side crashes, serious injury was four and a half times more likely. People paid attention. When asked, more than 60% of parents said they were complying with the new recommendations. Obviously, that meant lots weren't, though. Then in 2016, a biostatistician hired as an expert witness in a lawsuit against a car seat manufacturer tried to replicate the 2007 study with this publicly available data. She couldn't get the numbers to work. She contacted the journal, which contacted the study authors. They realized they'd made a mistake with survey weights. That, when corrected, made the results no longer significant. The paper was retracted. The authors, to their credit, went back to work on a new study with corrected methods. Because time had passed, they could now look at data on car crashes from 1988 through 2015. They were able to include more than 1,100 children from 0 to 23 months who were in accidents and were in the database. Of these children, 47 sustained significant injuries in the crashes, and only 17 of those were between 1 and 2 years old. From these rare instances, they could not detect any statistically significant differences between children who'd been in front or rear-facing car seats. The researchers concluded, and I'm quoting, Field data are too limited to serve as a strong statistical basis for these recommendations. This has left people once again debating whether parents in the United States need to keep wrestling children into rear-facing car seats all the way to age two. The researchers and the American Academy of Pediatrics give an emphatic yes, pointing to laboratory sled tests on crash dummies and accident data from elsewhere, almost always Sweden. But focusing on this small age range misses the more useful lessons from this case of corrected science, which is that the United States could do a lot more to make roads safer for children and easier on parents. The sled tests, which use test dummies, strongly suggest that rear-facing car seats perform better than front-facing car seats in children through age three. In Sweden, children use rear-facing seats all the way to age four, then move to front-facing booster seats. Here in the United States, we use these front-facing car seats from about two years old until children outgrow them. How do Swedish parents manage this? For one thing, rear-facing car seats in Sweden and other parts of Europe are different from those here in the United States. They're often built with this bar that comes down from the car seat to rest on the floor of the car. This allows the seat to rest farther from the back of the car's rear seat, giving the child much more room. Parents in Sweden find it easier to get bigger children into them. Such seats, which are not available in the United States, were also found to be safer in the sled test than the versions we use. But rear-facing car seats for older children are just one of the many differences between the United States and Sweden. Because accidents are inevitable, Swedish regulations aim to make them non-lethal. Roads rely more on roundabouts, less on intersections. Cars are not allowed to turn at all, when pedestrians are crossing. There are national camera enforcement policies, like everywhere. Sweden also focuses on pedestrian bridges and separates cars from bicycles and oncoming traffic. Far fewer people drive under the influence of alcohol. Stricter policing has reduced impaired driving to less than 0.25% of tested drivers, 
versus about 1.5% of American drivers. And Sweden also has a more stringent definition of driving under the influence at about 0.02% versus 0.08% here in the United States. The speed limit in areas where cars might come into contact with pedestrians, think all of New York City, is less than 20 miles per hour. Speed bumps and other traffic calming interventions are common, and the average cost of obtaining a driver's license is the equivalent of more than $1,800 in the United States. All of this seems to work. Over the last 20 years, Sweden reduced pedestrian deaths by 31% and overall traffic deaths by 45%. In 2013, Sweden's rate of death from car accidents was about 3 per 100,000 people, about one quarter the rate in the United States. But Swedes are not necessarily satisfied with that. They've bought into a program known as Vision Zero, which is summarized in one sentence, no loss of life is acceptable. If America really wanted to get serious about reducing deaths on the road, especially those of children, a lot could be learned from Sweden. Doing so would mean adopting many significant changes to roads, to laws, and to car seats, namely using the Swedish-style rear-facing ones until children reach four. Dr. Marilyn Bull, a pediatrician at IU School of Medicine with me, and an author of the retracted and resubmitted paper, discussed the state of the latest research with me and mentioned Road to Zero, a U.S. federal program begun in 2016 that aims to eliminate traffic deaths by 2050. She said, and I'm quoting, the best we can do right now is to keep children rear-facing and car safety seats to the highest weight or height allowed by the seats manufacturer. Our road to zero deaths on U.S. highways, though, will require us to advocate for support of improved data collection, continued research, as well as regulatory change and design innovation to allow even larger children to ride rear-facing. As she suggests, setting more toddlers into rear-facing American-style car seats is advisable for making children safer, but it's only a start. Hey, did you enjoy this video? It really does help if you like or subscribe to the show right down there. And while we've got you, anything you can do to help support the show in other ways is appreciated as well. And one way to do that is Patreon.com, a subscription service which allows you, the user, to support the show for as like a little dollar a month. And if you don't want to, that's fine. It will always be free. But if you can, it helps make the show bigger and better. We'd really like to thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz, Carlos Hiergos, and Crafty Geek, and as always, especially, our Surgeon Admiral Sam. Go to patreon.com slash healthcare triage. Link's also down below. And while we've got you, get any merch you like at httmerch.com and my book, The Bad Food Bible, still out there, still available in stores. Really appreciate it if you pick up a copy. 